All right, welcome back. Uh, let me just post present the notes. All right, so just a side note here uh, to conclude what we've been talking about. The Apostle Paul is not forbidding us to marry. He's simply presenting that there will be challenges, real life challenges that comes with marriage. Um, um, but he also says that marriage is good because it's God's design. Right? Uh, first Timothy 4, 1 to 3, Paul wrote that forbidding to marry is a doctrine of demons. I'll just read that, right? 4, 1 to 3. The Spirit clearly says, First Timothy 4, 1 to 3, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, a doctrine of demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. You see that? He's saying the teachings, Paul is writing to the, the same writer, right? To the call, he's putting it across in a different way. So that is why it's so important to interpret scriptures in light with other scriptures. And we did that in Mormonetics, right? right? We can't take one scripture and say, okay, this is why I will. You know, uh, I'm, I'm forbidding or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Here, yeah, Paul is saying, in, 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 when you read the whole of this, he's saying it's good that I, you're single just as I am. But why is he saying it? Right? So that the focus is on the Lord. But he's not saying marriage is wrong because he knows that marriage is God's design. And here he's saying to Timothy, he's saying there will come a time when there will be hypocritical liars, deceiving spirits who are teaching. Uh, doctrine of demons saying that you should not get married. So what does it say? Paul is just putting forth his thoughts and he's saying God has called you and given you the gift, the grace of being single. Go ahead with it. If not, get married. Right? So that's that's the end of it. That's the end of the end. If you're married, there are certain things that you have to do, and he get, he you know we just talked about all of that, right? Now, verse thirty nine, verse forty. Paul is he's giving a final word to those uh, to a wife whose husband has died, and so we can also reverse it the other way, right? Uh, maybe even a husband whose wife has died, right? So verse thirty nine and forty, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies. She is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. So basically, Paul is saying the woman is or a man who has lost their uh, spouse, right? They no longer are living. Uh, and the, the man or the woman can think about getting married again only in the Lord, again, only to a believer. But it, Paul is saying it's, it's good even if they don't marry. And later on, he also says, you know, uh, he's trying to bring the whole context. Again, if he says, I don't want, he or she says, I don't want to get married and continue in uh, sexual desires and passion, it's better for them to get married. Right? So so he ends with this. He says, the choice is yours. Right? But the whole objective of chapter 7 was whether we are married, whether we are single, whether we are, you know, uh, divorced and remarried again, sexual fulfillment, affection, care is something that we must all have for our uh, spouse. But our focus in all of this must be to serve the Lord. And that must be our focus. So maybe some of us may feel highly cold, right? I feel one day, example, maybe a young man, a young woman, in their early 20s feel that God has called them for ministry and God has already spoken to them. They're going to start an international ministry and bless thousands of life. Now this young man has a choice. 
man or woman, okay, this young person has a choice. One, if he or she feels that the God's grace gift of being single is upon them, they can continue on single. But later on, if this person is consumed with passion or sexual desires, it's better for him to get married. Two, the second way is person as a youth may feel this calling of God and a high calling in ministry, whatever. They can get married, they can have children and still do the ministry. And if you look around us, there are, I think, millions of people who are leaders and great people who have married, had children, went through all the challenges, yet they continue to focus on God into the ministry as well. Right? So we'll end with that chapter. Let's move into chapter eight. Okay, uh, it, it looks like uh, at each chapter, the Apostle Paul is bringing one problem after the other. Right? It, it, it's quite disheartening, but it's it's wonderful to see the way Paul is just, it's so much of love and so much of grace, he's bringing correction. So what is he doing in chapter eight? Paul turns his attention to another matter of question and a problem in the Corinthian church, which was food offered to idols, right? Now, we did look at the background of Cor, right? Temple of Aphrodite is there, got thousands of prostitutes, and when there's a temple, there was sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice could have been anything, right? Uh, it, it could have been eatables it could be it could have been food it could have been uh you know uh, herbs and plants anything it could have been anything right uh, and so whatever it is the question that came up is now just for us to get into context to what's happening there probably some of the believers said hey i've become a believer now and my neighbor is a unbeliever. He still goes to the temple of Aphrodite, he or she. But I'm a believer, but I'm good friends with that person. And we've been living together for, uh, he's my neighbor for the past 10 years. So during their feasts, they come and give food to us. And we know this food is sacrificed to the idols. So should we eat it or not? I, I'm sure all of us are able to bring the context now. Right? So this is the question that raised up. Should we eat food offered to idols? What do we do? It's, it was common in Corinth. It's common even right now where we are. So let's see what's Paul, what the Apostle Paul teaches us here. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. So you see, Paul, he's he's trying to, you know, uh, uh, he's trying to, he's not directly talking about it, but he's going to, you know, address the problem later on. He's, he's saying idols, just for us to understand, there are two kinds of idols. Idols are objects, you know, when we see in the Old Testament, uh, idols were idols, right? Regular physical idols uh, that people worshipped, right? Uh, uh, remember when Moses went up the mountain and they made a idol uh, uh, that looked like a calf and they worshipped that. So that was a physical idol. And then you got idols of the heart. These are things we hold into our in our heart, which are which give more importance or take a higher place uh, than God himself, right? Uh, so this is just a side note, right? So the two kinds of it. One is the physical idol, which we, none of us, I'm sure, uh, you know, bow down before. But then there are ideas in the heart, uh, which we must be careful of, right? The simple idol that could be in our heart is our phone. I always ask you know, people is you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you do? First thing, search for your phone 
or check your WhatsApp. Uh, and, uh, no, it's not wrong, right? I, I'm not bringing condemnation here. But it's just that, you know, priorities change. Right? Uh, there was a time I wake up and search on my phone, okay, what are the emails? I mean, it's good, right? I want to check my emails. I want to know what's going on for the day, what I must do, my plans and everything. But I realized that, hey, I'm not giving importance to God. The first thing that I do when I wake up must be, God, I want to thank you for this day that I, I, I can open my eyes. It is because of your grace. Anything that takes prominence over God becomes an idol. So now Paul is addressing idols that are not idols of the heart, but physical idols. Right? And we know that Aphrodite was a physical idol. Right? Things offered to idol, idols refers to anything offered in sacrifice to idols, and specifically to the uh, uh, to the flesh. Leftover sacrifices that were either eaten in uh, the temples or they are sold in the market. So let me. Uh, there are two scenarios that need to be addressed here. One is if the believer happened to be near a temple and was offered meat that was offered to a sacrifice uh, that was offered to an idol. Should we eat this? Right. So the believer, he happened to be in or near the temple. And there was food offered to the idol. Should I eat it? The second scenario has to do with the believers in the market where the meat is sold in general. Right? There are also meats that have been previously offered to idols. Right? Uh, and so these meats were often not marked as uh, specific you know, symbols that indicate that they were offered to idols. They're just sold generally. So to those who worshipped idols, this was spe special meat. Now, the question is, should a believer who went to the market now buy and eat such a meat that was offered as a sacrifice to idols? Right? Two, two scenarios. One, the believer is staying near or uh, next to a temple and he knows that this, this food is sacrificed to an idol. Should I eat it? And two, if there was, for example, there's an animal sacrifice that was made in the temple and it was remained. So what they would do is they would take that, go to the marketplace and sell it there. Right? Now, this was special meat, considered as special meat. Now, if a believer buys that, such a meat that was offered to idol, should we eat it? Right? So let's see what Paul goes on to say here. Right? I, I'm just putting context for these two scenarios. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. The people had knowledge because they had been taught about idols. But what happened in Corinth was their knowledge was puffed up. They, become, they became so proud that even knowing the truth, instead of walking in love, uh, you know, they were walking with arrogance. Right. They were saying that, see, your knowledge is good, but it puffs you up. It makes you proud. You, know, you look at a balloon, right? It's small, right? But you keep blowing it, what happens? It becomes big, big, big. It puffs up. But what does love do? It edifies people. Knowledge is important. But knowledge of the truth must be held together with love. So we don't go condemning people who worship idols because they don't know the truth. Right? They don't know the truth about idols. But we must walk in love. Right? Now, what's happening here? The believers, there were people who are mature, there were people who are still you know, growing, and the people who have maybe just become believers, they have no idea what to do. But all they know is they prayed and they feel that God has, you know, changed them. They've become new in their heart and they want to know more about God and they're coming to church. Just simple believers, maybe one week or two days old in the Lord. They don't know anything. Now, what, are, what is happening here? People who, 
who are saying, hey, you know, I know about this. I've been, uh, you know, taught, I know about idols. They are nothing, you know. Uh, they, their knowledge is puffed up. They're not walking in love. They're not saying, uh, you know, the love of Christ is not compelling them. And, and not. it's not like they want to walk in love to teach the fellow believers. They're being puffed up. So Paul is looking at it and saying, hey, that's why he, before answering the question, he's saying, your knowledge is buffing you up. We're supposed to walk in love, right? Then he says, verse four onwards. Therefore, loving, like before that, he says, loving God and loving people is prime importance. So don't, you know, puff up your, uh, the way you are. Stay humble, be humble, love people, love God and do what God wants you to do as a person. Then he goes to the problem. Therefore, concerning eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world and that there is no other God but one, right? Now, the idol itself is nothing, right? And we know it, right? The idol is a lifeless object with no power of its own. Uh, you know, there may be many demonic works or things, so-called gods and many objects that represent things in heaven and earth that are worshipped. Right? Now, for example, if you look at the Roman culture uh, and Greco-Roman Greek and Roman uh, uh, century, it was more of the stars and the planets and the, the moon and uh, uh, the god of Ra, which is the uh, half, you know, the half uh, moon god, and all kinds of things, right? Now, there we know that there is no other god but God the Father, the Lord Jesus, through whom all things were created and all things exist. We know that truth, and right? that truth is established in our heart. Idol is nothing. Uh, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah is wonderful. If you, if you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah gives a whole account of you know what is an idol. I forget that chapter, but uh, he goes on in Jeremiah. He maybe I'll look at the chapter then later on. He 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 explains to the uh, to the he's talking to the Jews. He's saying, okay, you people are worshiping these idols. You know what it is? They go into the forest. They cut a tree. They take the wood, they shape it into something, they put ornaments on it, they carry it over their shoulders, they pro they move it everywhere because it cannot be moved. It has eyes but cannot see, ears that cannot hear, mouth but cannot speak. It can't do anything. And so Jeremiah is so passionate and he's so aggressive in that chapter and he says, this is what you're worship. He, he can't even move and walk about because he needs to be carried around. And this is what you're worshiping. Right? So we are not fearful of an idol or things offered to an idol. But in chapter 10, later on, we see that uh, there are demonic spirits behind an idol. Uh, and, and so we look at that later on. But here continues. However, there is not everyone. Uh, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Right? So let's look at that. Some people, they know the truth. For them, you know, uh, God, God is, the Lord Jesus is God. God is God. He is greater. Nothing is greater than him. But some people do not know the truth. For them, the idol is their God, and it's an object of their worship. So if they eat what is offered to the idol uh, with consciousness of the idol, it is their act of worship to the idol. And, and so Paul is addressing here, and he's saying, later on also we'll see that uh, when, when we are, when we know the truth, it is above anything else, above what is happening uh, around us, right? Uh, so he's saying the truth is important. Verse 8, but food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we worse, right? So let's look at that. 
verse 8. Neither if we eat are we better. So he's saying here, the food that we eat does not bring us close to God or bring us away from God. So basically, Paul is saying, now, I know that this is an issue, this is a problem. Before I get to solving your problem, let me tell you that maybe some of you are eating, some of you are not eating. But to those who are eating, food does not bring you closer to God. For those who are not eating, food does not, it's, it, because you're not eating, it does not bring you closer to God. So basically, he's trying to say, hey, there's a relationship that's involved. Right? Verse 9 onwards, he says, right, they're talking about our liberty and our knowledge should not cause another to stumble. Right? So, verse 9. But be aware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Right? And, and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Right? So let's look at that first scenario here. What if we are near an idol's temple and there's food or sacrifice to an idol? What should we do? Right? We know that food is sacrificed to idol. And maybe in your office, right? We know there's a food sacrifice to idols. There are, uh, you know, few believers and unbelievers. We all are sitting together, right? Now, the important thing is that the freedom we have is because we know the truth that God is above all of this. But this freedom should not cause another person, a weak believer who's maybe new in the faith who still does not understand these things it must not cause this person to stumble right so for example if i am i may be 10 years in the lord for example and i'm in an office and or you know with, with my friends and i know that there's another person who's just a believer for maybe one year in the lord and he does not understand these things right for the sake of that person, I will not eat it. But I know the truth that it is nothing, right? Uh, because the truth is, God is the idol is just an idol, right? Uh, and and verse ten, we'll talk more about this, right? So here he goes on, right? Uh, if he sees who is strong in the Lord Jesus, if the person who's Whose weak sees who's strong, uh, eat food offered to idols. The weak brother will mistakenly think that we are also reverencing the idol that has been that has been worshipped. So the weak brother will think, "Hey, this person is eating the food offered to idols. So that means he is honoring that god. He may think that. Right? Now we may not be doing so." We may be just, okay, hey, it's good, I'll just eat it. But because of their ignorance and observing, and by observing what we do, they are encouraged to do something wrong. Right? Remember, our actions speak louder than words in anything, not only in this matter. Our actions speak louder than words. So here, Paul is saying, I know the truth. I know that I should, that an idol is an idol. It's nothing. It's lifeless. It has no power. I know that God is inside me. I'm a temple of God and I'm, and I'm strong. And God has made me, you know, I believe in God. But for the weak brother, I, you know, so that, you know, the wrong stance we take, we, we must not say, no, let him learn. Or let her learn that even if you eat, nothing will happen. Right? Now, we don't want a weak brother involving in something that he is not fully convinced of. 
and our action in such a situation can cause the weak brother to sin. Right? Uh, so what is it? In such a situation, it is best not to eat food offered to the idol. Right? It is best not to do that. So that we can stay away from we is it is it because we are fearful? Is it because I'm saying, okay, uh, what if something happens later on? Right? Uh, it's not because of that, because we know the truth. But for the weak brother, so that he may not sin. Now picture this, say if there's somebody who's a weak brother or a sister in Christ, and they see you eating this food, right? And they say, hey, I'm like, okay, because you're eating, when I believe, because I know, know that God is, uh, now he eats this. And then one week later, he falls ill or something happens, right? Uh, just naturally, he just falls ill or something happens in office, something goes wrong. That he may attribute that problem to what happened. It may be because last week or two weeks back, I had this food offered to idols and now I'm going through this problem. That is a weakness, right? But those who are strong, who know the truth, you know, you know that you know. Hey, through every season, God is with me. God will strengthen me, right? So the first scenario about food sacrifice to idols, when there is a new believer or somebody who's still, you know, maybe you're sharing the gospel with somebody, and this person. Right, uh, offers you some food that was sacrificed to idols, what would be our response? Now, the wrong thing to do is to say, okay, now see, I'll have your food offered to your idol. Your idol is nothing. Let me eat it. I'll show you how you know nothing's gonna happen to me. See, because God is my God is greater than your God. That would be the wrong thing to do. Right? The best thing to do in that situation is say, hey. You know, I just want to talk to you about what is our body and how we can honor God. Just, uh, just talking to them about the importance of being the temple of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is. You can bring out these uh, points because you know you're trying to bring this person into Christ. You don't want to bring condemnation because now, for example, if he becomes a believer, you ate this food, he becomes a believer after one month, he will go back and continue to eat that food because he, this guy also ate, or this person also ate. He shared the gospel with me. He is mature and mature. he ate so and I'm eating. So we must be very careful. Right? Our intention is not to puff ourselves up because of knowledge, but he says, love edifies one another. For the love of this person, the love of God that he has put in, inside me, for the love that I have for this person, I don't want to see this weak brother or sister falling. So I am willing to not eat, to sacrifice this, meaning uh, I'm, I'm willing to let go of this, even though I know that it's nothing that is going to affect me, but for the sake of the other person, I'm not willing to eat it. Right, so he ends there with chapter 8 saying that, right? Uh, let's move on to chapter 9. Before that, any questions? Let me just get to the chat. Any questions? Uh, Yes, Sri Kumar, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I just want, I need a clarification. I know what you uh, what you explain, but then also uh, to sometimes to explain others, I need a little bit <laughs> more clarification. Yes. Sure, go ahead. So um, uh, I just want to know that, um, you know, um, there are, um, as you said, like this, but um, even I know that the, the Bible very clearly says that the witchcraft and the divination uh, does not work against uh, you know yeah. uh, uh, the, but um, even though I have seen something which uh, um, uh, around me where the yeah. believers are attacked uh, yeah. because of the witchcraft and other thing um, yeah. um, and by you know uh, unknowingly I just want to know that um, even though the scripture says those things is it because of the lack of their faith on the gospel is it happening or um, something else because when we when we praise many things comes out and you know they vomit it out 
and so many things is it because of they have the open doors or they know that they are not completely dwelling in this truth uh i just want to know that so that is one of the reason just uh, people just avoid to eat the anything which comes from the idol or anything so keep them so i just need a clarification on that thank you master yeah, yeah thank you thank you yes Rick. so uh, again in chapter 10 we'll discuss a little more about that uh idols and feasts and uh, uh what Boston paul said but to answer your questions we can see when you look at a bondage right uh, there's a process there's a there are stages when, when it comes to a bondage right? so for example uh, you know the, the bible says that do not give the enemy a foothold lest he takes the entire place right so many times believers are going through probably problems of witchcraft or uh, there's constant failure there's constant you know uh, diseases or sicknesses there's constant you know troubles in their life now two reasons one could be a uh, 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 uh you know a generational bondage that has been continued over years and years and years and nobody has taken authority and broken that bondage that's one right it's just a generational curse or bondage as has continued you know many a times and uh, you know there are people who uh you know every firstborn is dying right from generation so they know okay the firstborn will die secondborn will live firstborn will die right so it's it's going on over generation. So it's a bondage, it's a generational curse which has to be broken. The, the believer must take the authority and break that bondage. Right now, the same way, there are many things or many uh, you know circumstances or many challenges that we face, and we may make wrong decisions and we get into we let the enemy take a foothold. Right? So for example. A believer, how can a believer be in depression? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The God is with us. The Holy Spirit is in us. How can a believer be in depression? And it happens. And it's sad. Right? Uh, now, we don't condemn them for being a believer. How can you? Uh, but what happens is the we let the enemy, we give them a foothold. Right? We're saying we are allowing the enemy to take that one place. Right? We're giving that small space. We're saying, okay, you know, it could be anything, right? It could be like, you know, in any way. Uh, so we're giving the enemy that small area in our life. And what is he going to do? He's going to keep, you know, he's going to try and take the whole room because he's got one step in that room, right? And if we are not careful, if we do not resist the devil, right? Uh, uh, that's why Paul Peter writes, you no. Know, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee for you. And I like that because first we have to submit to God. Right? So, Sri Kumar, there will be believers who are going through all of these witchcraft and all these, you know, uh, uh, you know the enemy is just playing around with them. Uh, and it's sad to see that. But the truth is, maybe one, it's a generational bondage which they can break. God will break it. Right? Two, they have open doors in their life uh, to you know let the enemy work so powerfully in, in their life. Yet God is able to restore. Right, so it's not always a lack of faith from their side. Um, it's more of you know uh, their own um, their own mistakes or their own things that they have done. And you know sometimes it's also this you know we have the authority but we don't use it. And that's a sad thing to uh, for us, right? As believers, uh, you know, we limit God and we say, "Okay, God, we're only for this, we're only for that, only on Sundays." No, but you know, God has given us the authority. Is there anything that God cannot do? So there are many times, right? We go to missions and uh, to different places in our nation. We see wonderful believers, but they are trapped in, you know, probably witchcraft or they. Uh, possessed or oppressed by the devil. Right? Why is that? Because we have opened and given the doors to the enemy. Right? Uh, what can we do in such a situation? Continue to pray, continue to ask God to bring healing and deliverance and ask God to bring restoration. These kind of, and the Lord Jesus said, they, these kind of situations need fasting and prayers. 
right? So you need people praying for them. They must be praying. They must be careful uh, to overcome things that the enemy is doing. So, uh, so uh, Sri Kumar, yeah. So these are the two uh, reasons that I can think of right now. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Kennedy says so. In order to eat meat that is slaughtered by a Muslim, because they normally perform halal prayer, so is it in in order to eat meat that is slaughtered by a Muslim? Because they normally perform halal prayer before slaughtering. Okay. Um, so to answer your question, Kennedy, if it is sold in the market, right, and you're buying it in the, in the sense that you're just buying it to eat in your family, or uh, and there's no questions raised up, hey, is this uh, offered to idols, or if it is it offered to uh, the thing? I would say if you're buying it in the market, and it's not, uh, you know. Uh, marked as, you know, or, or you know, you're buying it in the market, you can just buy it and eat it. Right? It, it is not going to affect you. But if it's something that if people ask you, so for example, you have a life group, right? You're sitting in the life group and you say, okay, we're going to buy uh, meat, and this is what it is. And if somebody in that life group is a believer, who's a new believer, and says, uh, but isn't this meat offer, offered to? By prayer to the uh, to the gods of uh, is Islam or, 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 or offered to idol and isn't it prayed over by the other gods? Isn't it going to be a problem? Now, as a leader, what would I do? I would say, if you feel not comfortable with this, then we can do something else. We can avoid it. Why? Because of that person, that one person. Right? But if everyone are okay with it, you say, okay. Uh, no, eventually we will all buy right from the market, right? So, uh, so Paul is it was interesting the first issue. So, so just that's just that example, right? If one person out of the fifteen people are not is not comfortable with it, for that one person I will not do it. I will not buy it because I don't want that one person who may be weak in the Lord who's still growing. I don't want him to follow this sin just because I feel I know that I'm doing the right. Right. And later on, Paul gives certain guidelines in chapter 10. He talks a little bit about, uh, you know, idols and how, what is the believer's freedom? What is the freedom that we have and how we must use the freedom of God and freedom that God has given us uh, in the right way. Right. Uh, uh, before we go, I just wanted to, you know, I know that some of us um, have come from, uh, you know, the different faiths uh, and uh, no, I just thought if Tarun is here. Tarun, you're here. Okay. All right. So I just thought we could hear from each of us. What What are your thoughts about this? Uh, anybody else here? You have you know come from a probably a background where there was you know food offered to idols. Uh, and what what do you think it is? What do you uh, believe in your heart regarding this whole thing of food sacrifice uh, to idols? And maybe you can share some examples or some things that happened. Uh, is there anyone here? Uh, I know that Tarun and I have had many discussions on this. Anybody else here have any? Okay, so nobody nobody has had. Okay, I can share a couple of. Uh, uh, there's this one time uh, in office uh, when I was working in office, uh, uh, which is the IT company that I was working in, and uh, uh, I, I forget what festival it was. And uh, you know, uh, during that time, we had a small prayer group that was happening in uh, in the office setting, right? So I started a small prayer fellowship and we were about 10 15 years just coming together we would spend about half an hour in worship and reading the word and we would pray in just half an hour 45 minutes and, um, and so many times uh, you know these uh, festival times right they would come and they would offer it to me right uh, now i was very strong right? in the sense that i knew okay this is nothing uh, doesn't matter to me Personally, 
uh, you know, when I was alone at home, right? Uh, but in the office setting, when they've come and offered it to me, I've said no. The reason being because there are people who are part of my prayer group or the prayer group that we have started. And they may have a lot of questions. I knew that there are some of them there who are you know, just new believers. They have a lot of questions. There were some who were atheists. There were some who were, you know, not even believers. They were from other faiths, but they were coming for that, you know, the time of fellowship. Now, if I had eaten it, it would have raised many questions. And it would have, you know, even though I didn't eat it, they, there were questions raised. But, uh, but you know, it was, it stood as a testimony. And so I believe that whatever setting we are in, our intention must be that the brother and sister around us, the weaker brother and sister, must not be affected. They must not come to a place of, you know, uh, of just saying, okay, just because this person did it, I will do it. And he, may, he or she may fall and may even uh, turn to a place where they may go away from Christ, may fall into the trap of the devil just because of this one incident that happened. Right? So we have a choice. That's why Paul begins the chapter so beautifully. He says, knowledge puffs us up. I think we know everything, but it is love that edifies us, that builds each other. So I want to leave us with that. Uh, we will close for today. Uh, we'll pick up next week. Uh, we'll go from chapter 10, uh, sorry, chapter 9. Uh, we'll talk about how the Apostle Paul is, after explaining all this, he says, why am I saying all this? He's saying he's, he's portraying his right as an apostle of Christ. He's saying the reason I'm sharing all this is because I'm an apostle who has been sent to you. And as a spiritual leader, as a father, this is what I am. I am free to speak my mind out because you are my children. Uh, yes, Christopher, go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to check. There's some, there are some, uh, some people who, who will always pray before uh, they eat anything or before a meal. Mm. And um, sometimes they even do it, you know, in, a, in, a, in an environment which is outside of the house. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just want to understand if is that a is that a good practice is that something that uh, one should do uh, uh, regularly I mean uh, as a practice just wanted to get your view on that okay so you're talking about believers just maybe going to a restaurant and it's good to pray and uh, eat is that is that your question is that a good practice yes yes and yes. there are times I mean it's happened in in, in front of me sometimes where right. a believer will you know um, will uh, look at a certain food or you know uh, sometimes yeah. it's just something that you know maybe i've gone out and you know uh, yeah. it happened to me once you know in, in my office where i went and brought some some juice for someone and that person said uh, where did you buy this juice from because i'm not going to have it at all and you know they were quite uh, uh, you know they, they, they just uh, felt that you know yeah. it was not something that uh, was uh, was uh, was the f was something that they could they could actually drink yeah yeah Yes. Yes, that's a good question, Christopher. So if you look at it practically, right? Now, for example, I go out. I have the habit, whether I'm at home, and I'm sure most of us have this habit, right? Whether we're at home, whether we're outside, we just pray and eat. So wh why do we do that? We're praying that the food that we eat will nourish us, will strengthen us. It will be a blessing to our body. And we're also saying, God, thank you for this food, because you it is you who provided this food. Right. It's, it, it has been there from the Old Testament where the prophet, where the priest would uh, take the uh, offering uh, right before he uh, distributes the offering. I mean, he takes a portion of the offering and he leave the rest for uh, for the, you know, for the temple foods uh, when they're going to cook and all of that. So the one that was what they would do is they would they would before offering it, they would pray to God. Right? So it's even now. We, we pray to God, we say, God, bless the food. Let it nourish our body. Let it strengthen our body. 
and uh, we're just being thankful for God, right? So it's it's not that we are trying to say that okay, this food I'm sitting at a you know restaurant which is not doesn't look like a Christian restaurant, so I have to pray double. It's not about that, right? So we, we what we're doing is we're just praying for the food that we eat, just like how we pray for everything else. We say God, thank you for this food, bless the food, and let it be a nourishment to our bodies. Right. Uh, and when I'm outside, I just do that simple prayer, right? So we thought, thank you for this food. Bless it, nourish it to my body, and help me to be strong and healthy to do your work. Simple prayer, that's it, right? Uh, so it's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, anywhere, even there are times we can have a tea outside, we can pray a blessing over it. Uh, it's not wrong at all, Christopher, right? uh, not at all. Uh, we are called to pray for everything, give thanks and everything that we are doing. So, yeah, it's not, we can pray. Right now, there are people who are, you know, who are believers maybe who are weak and say they don't want to eat or drink from this uh, hotel or they feel that it's not right. You know, personally, uh, I know of a couple of friends who said, you know, they didn't want to go to this restaurant. Uh, because they know that early morning at 7 a.m. in the morning, they have some kind of, you know, the whole prayer thing, you know, uh, what they call uh, like a worship that's happened to their idols. And he does all that. He takes those, you know, those incense sticks and he walks around the whole, uh, uh, you know, the hotel. And he, that whole, that the entire hotel is, you know, uh, restaurant places filled with that uh, incense sticks smell. And uh, so there are a couple of them. I, uh, friends who said, no, I don't want to go there because this is what they do. So it's okay. You say, okay, let's choose another place. Uh, I don't have to say, hey, nothing will happen there, nothing, you know. If they feel weak in that area, then leave it. Uh, so wherever, whether I go here to this place or that place, even if I go to a Christian restaurant, which you are playing in Christian songs, I will pray over my food. Right, so, yeah, so. All right. Okay, so let's close in prayer and uh, we'll catch up next week. Right? Maybe one of us can close. Anybody? Sri Kumar, do you think we can close in prayer? Or anybody else? Kennedy, Christopher, anyone can close in prayer. Yes, awfully silent. Anyone, please close in prayer. Okay, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful time, of God, of just learning. And Lord, I thank you for the wisdom of God in your word, God, thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. Thank you, Lord, that uh, even as we come together and learn, Lord, your word is true, your word is faithful. And I pray, God, that even as we learn, that you will continue to empower and strengthen us. Lord, uh, Lord, I pray that you will help us, Lord, not just to grow in knowledge and wisdom, but to walk in love, because love is what edifies one another and I pray God that the love of God will fill our hearts that even as we walk this life Lord that our, the love that you have put in our hearts will be an overflow in everything that we do Lord. we speak your blessing over each and every student may your grace your anointing and your wisdom rest upon each one of them oh God thank you Father we pray God that you will continue to teach us throughout the entire week in Jesus name we pray amen mm -hmm. Hey man, thank you so much everyone. God bless. Have a great week. See you next week.